your fortune and fame I had nothing but doubt and confusion But now I have everything Everything I need When he saved me and he gave me life eternal and now I have everything I was made. I was living my life so in vain. Then I prayed for life's only meaning. And now I have everything. Everything. Sometimes when you get sang, when I do get to sing, and I, I forget about the guitar. All right, Brother Rick, come on, Brother Sonny. We're ready for you. Hallelujah. Give him a hand. Praise God. Let's give Jesus a hand. I love this good singing. I know, brother, <laughs> talking about that there was 10,000 angels that Jesus could have called. And I wanted to just tell you that it's a little bit more than that. It said he could call 12 legions of angels. 12 legions of angels. A legion of angels is 6,000 angels. 12 of them make 72,000 angels. Over in the book of Isaiah, there was an angel that killed 185,000 men in one night. If you do the math, that's 13 billion, 320 million that 12 legions of angels could kill in one night. Guess what? There's not that many people living on the face of the earth today. So when all these people play with their little old nuclear weapons and they want to think that they're a big threat and there ain't no God, stick around. They're going to find out one day. Tonight I want to talk to you. It hadn't been long since Mother's Day and how important Mother's Day is. But I want to talk to you tonight about how important fathers are. If you want to look now back in the Old Testament, the very first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, and we think about how they started out in the Garden of Eden. It was all perfect and all beauty. All they had to do was just dress the garden and talk to God and walk with God every day. But along came Satan, who is our enemy for now, and he tempted Eve, and he gave her the forbidden fruit, as they call it. Some say it was apple, some say apricot, 
I don't know what it was, and I don't care. It's just the fact that God said, don't touch it. Do you realize tonight that if they had have just used their head a little bit, the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden. All they had to do was partake of the tree of life, and they'd live forever. But after they messed up and sinned before God and disobeyed Him and went the wrong direction, then God drove them out of the garden. God hates sin. Our Heavenly Father loves us, but He don't love the sin that we were in. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus paid a price for every person that would accept that price. You know, I could tell you that I had give you a million dollars if I had a million, that all you had to do was go to the bank and get it. And you never went to the bank and got it, you'd never have a million dollars. Now, God has said Jesus is a sacrifice for your sins. But if you never accept Him and ask Him into your life, then you're going to be lost from now on. I read a story one time about a man over in England, and he was being hung on the gallows. And the king felt sorry for him. And he said, I'm going to give him a pardon. And they went and told the man to just take him up the gallows, said, the king's pardon, he's going to turn you loose. He said, I'm not accepting his pardon. I'm not taking it. I won't, won't accept it. And they went back and told the king. The king said, well, a pardon not accepted is not a pardon. And they hung the man. Do you know where that bull headed? God told us how to get to heaven. He gave it to us in his book. He told us how to live here. And we neglect it all just for the sake of our little ego, of momentary happiness. You know, David, David was a man after God's own heart. And yet he got wandering eyes like many people do today. So when we talk about fathers, <laughs> a lot of times I used to say, well, you know what, I'd like for my kids to all follow after David. I mean, you don't get much better than being a man after God's own heart. But after I studied the Bible a while, and after I saw the things that David had to go through, I said, I don't want my kids to go through that. And I studied and studied, and I thought, well, who would be a better father figure for my kids? And I can find no one any better than what Joseph was. Joseph started out with, you heard about his coat of many colors and how jealous his brothers were, and that he kind of lowered it over their heads. He, he got out of character, too. He bragged a little bit about that. He wanted them to know his daddy's favorite. You see... Sometimes today, daddies have favorites. And what it does is drive the other kids crazy. My wife used to accuse me all the time of having my older son was my favorite son. And my younger son heard that. And he's thought his whole life, and I hope he watches this and listens to this, because I'm not telling you anything he don't know. But he got in his head that I always favored his big brother. And he tried to keep up with him. He tried to do all these things. And I never could get it through his head that I love both of them equally. I may not love the things they do equally, but I love both of them equally. There's nothing I wouldn't do for them. You see, God is our Father. God is our Father. And as fathers on this earth, we need to be about our Father's business by being the Father that we ought to be. Do you know the biggest problem I think facing America today, the reason the world's going down the tubes? There's too many fathers that are absent without leave. Too many homes growing up without fathers there. We sure just change around and keep things in a turmoil all the time, and sometimes we don't even understand whose father's who. And it's just a terrible thing that there are, I think, about 70% at the last figure I heard of absent fathers. Now, what this world would be if fathers stayed home and taught their kids like they ought to? What a world this would be if we fulfilled what God wanted us to do. But a lot of times we're like Adam. We listen to the wrong temptations. 
We listened to the wrong things. And as sin entered into Adam and into the Garden of Eden, it enters into our hearts. And we go looking around and we get off on the wrong place and we do the wrong things. On the Psalm 27, 10, it says, When my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Do you understand what that means? Do any of you understand? I'm sure a lot of you do. But I'm going to tell you this. It means simply that when the father and the mother desert the child, the Lord's going to adopt him. He's going to supply everything that this child needs. Well-being, health, whatever he needs is going to be took care of. You know, sometimes it might make you wish your mother and father did drop you because the Lord's going to take a lot better care of us than earthly parents are able to. I know they strive hard and they love us, but they can't meet up to what God gives us. And the Lord will take us up and set us in heavenly places. I want to just tell you a little story about me. When I was growing up, I was in a home that didn't have any fatherly leadership. <laughs> and i got to tell you this, too. A lot of it was my fault. A lot of it was my fault. I've been hard-headed forever. I've been told recently that one somebody didn't kill me before I got grown. I say amen to that. It, it is one for the goodness of God they would have. But I didn't have that kind of fatherly leadership. I did not. And when things got rough around the house and my mother passed away, me and my dad just couldn't make it. He was home, but he was absent when it come to trying to teach people things. The only thing that I got off of my father that I can relate to that was a benefit to me was he was like me, he was a workaholic. He loved to work, and he was always at work. It didn't matter how drunk he got on at night time, come 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning when he had to be at work, he was there. And he did his job, and he did it for all of us, and there was nine of our children. And things got rough, and I left home at age 14 and moved to Alabama. I ain't going to tell you where I was born. I tell a few people, but I'm not. But I moved to Alabama, and I have a sister that lives down here now. Is the only relative I have here other than my family. And she talks about going home, and I tell her, well, I'm at home. I'm at home. Don't talk to me about home. But I moved here and moved in with my brother who became kind of a father. He let me do some things and led me in some things that were good and some that were bad. But I never had what I see today in some fathers. You know, I'm not lambasting all fathers. There are great earthly fathers. I see some of them and I admire them so much, I want to say, God, why couldn't I have been that kind of a father? Because I confess to you tonight, that I miserably failed my children in a lot of ways because I spent too much time teaching them how to make a living instead of how to live. And, and that bothers me because I can't go back and change it. But I'm telling you tonight, fathers, if you're listening, pay attention. Don't work four or five jobs. Do without some things because they don't want things. They want dad at home. And that's what we need to focus on this year and every day of our life till the Lord comes back. Don't be an absent father. Take the example that was set for God our Father. Everything that we need, we can find in Him. I mentioned Joseph a while ago. I know most of you know the story of Joseph. But he was thrown in a pit by his brothers. They went back and told his dad he's dead. He ended up in Egypt, and he was in the Potiphar's house. And he had a lot of favor with him. But Potiphar's wife had her eye on him. So she really tried to just to persuade Joseph to be with her. And he just kept on telling her, I can't sin against my father. I can't sin against God. And I can't sin against your husband. That would be a sin against everybody. And it got so desperate that one time she locked the door and had him in her chambers. And she grabbed the hold of him 
when, when she did, he did what most of us would not have done probably. He pulled out of his clothes and ran away. Then she told a lie on him and claimed that he attacked her. He ended up in prison. He was there for quite a long time. And while in prison, God still gave him favor. And he interpreted some dreams, and I'm going to try to shorten it a bit, but he got out of prison, and he went back in Potiphar, not in Potiphar's house, but he got in good with the leader of Egypt, the ruler of Egypt. He interpreted a dream for him, and he put him next to him in Egypt. And as a father, he married into this family, and he took care of his kids, and not only his, but by the things that he put in place, Egypt was saved from a great famine that went on. And I just want to tell you tonight, sometime when you got time, read the story of Joseph and what a father he was. Because no matter what happened in his life, he was true to God. I can tell you, some people may fail you. God never will. If we could just set our sights on heaven, as some of these songs has been sung tonight, if we could just put our hands in Jesus' hand and say, Oh God, I pledge it all to you. I heard it put this way. If you're totally dedicated to God, you write out a blank check and sign it and hand it to him and say, God, you fill in what you want me to do. Cash the check any way you want to. I'm going to do just what you want me to do. You see, if you do that tonight, you're a father that God can depend on. Because the old saying goes, charity starts at home. The way to make this world better is to start at home and start with your children and be the father that you ought to be, where that when your children go out, they won't be ruining this world that God made so beautiful. In Psalm 10 and 3 and 13, it says, Like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord doth pitieth them that fear him. Now this word fear a lot of people, they think, well, that you have to be afraid of God. But this is an awesome fear. It's something that you have a deep reverence of God. And you value Him above everything. Many times we have gods in this world that we don't call gods. We won't own up to them being gods. But they control us. We have bad habits that are gods to us. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to explain that a little bit. We have habits that we say we cannot do without. we got to do it. You know what you can do without God? People does it every day. People walk away from God all the time. So know this. If something is closer to you, something that you don't can't let go of, it's a bigger God to you than our Father God. I told a man one time, and we were talking, and, and I was talking about God and about our Father and how He takes care of us. And I asked him, did he ever say the Lord's Prayer? And he told me he did. And some of you have heard me tell this. I'm not, not going to tell it all because it, it, it's not what I'm think, talking about. I'm talking about a Father. But I asked him, did he pray the Lord's Prayer? And he said he did. And I said, well, if you're not a Christian you got no right to pray the Lord's Prayer. If you're not a Christian, God ain't your father. He's your creator, but he's not your father. If you are a Christian, God has adopted you in to his family. As I read already, it said, When your father and mother forsake you, the Lord will take you up. You're adopted into the family of God, and God is going to take care of you just like you'd take care of your child. I dare say if you've got children tonight and one of them needs something, <laughs> there's nothing you wouldn't do to supply it if it's reasonable. God is the same way with us. When God looks down on us and he hears us crying out to him, he says, that's one of mine. I'm going to take care of them because they're adopted and they're my children and they're going to do what I want them to do. And I'm going to take care of them because 
God means for us to have some discipline in our life. I know I'm a person that's hard-headed. I, I readily admit that. I'm ashamed to, but I'll do it anyway. But I've always been a hard-headed person. And I just it just breaks my heart sometimes because I feel like God has told me to do something. And I miss the mark, and I fail to do it, and then I pay a big price for it. There's probably not one of you in here tonight that loves the Lord, that ain't had God tell you to go speak to somebody sometime. They, to go speak to somebody and try to witness to them and try to tell them about the plan of salvation. And we said, well, we're going to go later. I'll go next week. I'll go some other time. And you eventually, the person dies, and you don't ever get to witness to them. I've had that happen to me not once, but two times that I can recall off of the top of my head right this minute. You know what? I failed my Heavenly Father. You know what? That's one father that I don't want to fail. The Bible says, honor your father and your mother. And it's the very first commandment that's got promise to it. Many people say, honor your father and your mother. But do you know what else it says? It says that thy days may be long upon this earth, which the Lord thy God giveth you. God has promised long life for honoring your father and your mother. It it's just amazing to me that the dishonor and the disrespect that some kids have for their parents now. I've always had my nose stuck in, in my family's business as far as my kids and grandkids and even great-grandkids. And when, I, when I would be over at my son's house and some of the boyfriends start coming around, and they was the only one that ever blowed a horn that I can remember. But I, I told them, I said, you go out there and tell that young man that he can get out of the car and he can come in here. You ain't going nowhere with him. Because my son's kind of laid back, but I ain't when it comes to them kids. And they never, as I know, have ever had somebody else blow the horn. You're going to respect the ladies around my house. And I'm going to tell you this. If the young ladies now would think about what kind of a father that they're going with and that they might marry, what kind of father they're going to be, they might change their whole attitude about everything. I had, had one with granddaughters one time. She was a real smart aleck to her mom. And I said, I'm going to tell you something. You're going to respect your mom when I'm around. She may not make you do it. If you don't respect your mother, I said, I'm going to turn you up and tear you up. You know what response I got? There's places for people like you. I'll call DHR and you'll be put in jail. And I said, well, there's a telephone you have at it. And the day I get out, I'm going to come back and tear you up again. I love you too much to allow you to be disrespectful. God meant for us to be fathers all the way down the line. As Adam brought sin into the world, Jesus took it out of the world. And in between, he left us here to take care of this planet. And we got to take care of our kids and we got to see that they do things right because if we don't, who will? You've heard Sister Gurley say about some of the people on the street and people that have problems. And I'm not, I'm not knocking them. I'm not looking down on them. I've been there, done that. But if we don't reach out to them, who's going to? Everybody under the sound of my voice, everybody on this earth that can't hear me, we want you to be saved because that's the most important thing that can ever happen. The most important thing that your Father can teach you is to respect our Heavenly Father. Because without Him, we're going to a place that you just don't want to go. As I've said so many times, nobody's going to heaven by accident. You're not just going to one day say, well, I've been a good person and I'm going to make it wrong, wrong, wrong. No one's going to heaven by accident, and no one's going to hell on purpose. I have, I've been accused a few times of beating a dead horse sometimes about talking about the plan of salvation. I thought about a preacher I heard one time. He, he said he went and had a college professor 
and said his professor told him, said, you're a great preacher, there's just one thing wrong. Said, you're just too negative, and I wouldn't want to hear you preach. So he invited him to a service that he was running tonight, and he said, that night, and he said, I promise you if you come that I'll preach a positive message. And he went to the service tonight, and the professor sat way in the back, and the preacher said, hey, my professor's here tonight. And he explained to him about what he told him about being a negative preacher. And he said, I told him if he came, in his honor, I would preach a positive sermon. said, that's him back there. said, hold up your hand, professor. And he kind of held up a little bit, you know. And he said, and the title of my message tonight is, you're positively going to hell if you don't get saved. You know, that's what's going to happen. And we laugh about stuff. And I have too. And I, I thought about that a lot. But, you know, if we're fathers tonight, we need to set an example for our kids that if they follow us, they're going to get to heaven. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. You heard the old story about the father was walking through the snow and he heard a racket and he looked around and his son was following him and he saw him stretching out his legs and he said, what are you doing, son? And he says, I'm trying to walk in your footsteps, Dad. You know that's what's happening to this world today. We have people that are running around that are supposedly be fathers and they're not teaching their kids anything. And I had my dad told me when I was a kid and I I promise you, I'll never forget it. It's burned into my mind. He said, if I ever catch you with a cigarette in your hand, I'll knock it down your throat. You see, that's not a good example. That's not a good example. If I ever see you with a can of beer in your hand, I'll knock it down your throat. Listen to me. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Fathers, set an example for your kids. You're the example that they need to father, follow, follow. And God is the example. Jesus is our example. That as fathers, we ought to follow him. Again, I tell you, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. If your kid follows you, Father, those are out there on TV and those of you are listening to me. If your kid follows you, where are they going to end up in eternity? Where are they going to end up at? The Bible says honor them. And some of them are not fit to be honored. I'm sorry. But you should honor them anyway because God said so. I missed that for a long time. Proverbs 1 and 8, it says, My son, hear the instructions of thy father. We've got to teach our kids today. If we don't teach them, the devil's going to. There's going to be somebody on the street that's going to do our job for us, and we're not going to like the end result. I heard someone say one time that when they used to advertise where there's life, there's bud, talking about the beer. He said they ought to make somebody get a case of beer and stand over a corpse and keep pouring it down their throat and say, well, there's no life yet. Where's the life at in it? The trouble is all these great advertisements they have on TV, they don't show you the end results, the lung cancer, the stomach cancer, all the things that happen because of the life we live and the things that we do. And I've beat my head against a brick wall a lot of times, and I've got the scars to prove it. But by the help of God, I want to always, I want to always honor my heavenly Father. And I want to be the Father that He wants me to be. They, it says in Proverbs 3 and 12, For whom the Lord loveth, He correcteth, even as a father the Son, in whom He delighteth. Did you know if God don't chastise you, that you're not a son? The Bible says that if God don't chastise you, that you're a bastard and not a son. You're an illegitimate child. You're not born into the family of God. 
if he don't chasten your life. Many times we think chastisement's bad, but I got news for you. I need a few stripes on my back once in a while. I need to wear safety shoes to church once in a while. I need somebody to tell me, straighten up and fly right and walk all over my toes. And if they need to, get even higher than that and bust these old sore knees. I want to go to heaven, and I want everybody to go with me that will. I want to be the kind of a father that will spare not but cry aloud and try to warn a generation of lost people that could care less about God. You know the real problem that I worry about more than anything else. There's so many people today that have been deceived. They're in church. They're always there when the door opens. They leave a, leave a fairly good life, but they don't have God in their life. They don't have the Lord Jesus wrapped up in their life. And when the time comes, God is going to look at them and say, Sorry, I don't know you. Your name's not in the book. There are a lot of people today in hell screaming, Oh, God, you've made a mistake. I've lived a good life, and I don't belong here. I've done what my heavenly Father told me to do, and all these things. And they blame it all on God, just like Adam <laughs> blamed God. Adam blamed God for the shape this world's in today. Did you know God was the first scapegoat in the Bible? God was the first scapegoat. He told God, said, this woman that you gave me did give me to eat, and I did eat it. I want to throw this in just for good measure. I have a lot of people tell me they don't believe in women preachers. My response always is, they help get us in this mess. At least they do help get us out of it. <laughs> because... We, we need all the help we can get, man. If we didn't have, a, have somebody to straighten us out, we'd be in a terrible situation. Proverbs 30 and 11 says, There is a generation that curseth their father. This generation we're living in now, from a time a kid gets 10 or 11 years old, is already back-talking dad and mom. Cursing their father and everything else. You know, it's cute when they're about that high and they say these things and we laugh about it. When they get to be teenagers and break their heart, it's not funny anymore. In closing, I want to remind you, the Bible says in Matthew 23 and 9, Call no man your father on the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Now, all this that I've said, father, is earthly fathers that I've been talking about but as a role of a priest or a model then we're not to call somebody father some people get it wrong some people get it wrong that their fa our father is in heaven we don't have any other priest anymore except the Lord Jesus Christ and he set the example for us as fathers he set the example for us as men that we ought to stand steadfast in the faith. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Would you stand with me tonight? Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you that Jesus died for our sins, that one day we would have a home with you. And Father, help us all to examine ourselves and see if we're in the faith and Look around and see where we're leading our children to, that we might correct our course if it's wrong. We might look to you for strength to lead them in the right direction. I love you tonight, and I praise you, and I glorify your holy and righteous name, for you are God, our heavenly Father. Beside thee, there is none other. We love you and praise you and ask you to bless each one that's here tonight. And those that's out in TV land, by bringing conviction upon them and causing them to see their self as you see them, that things will be better in all their lives. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen.